Now, investments generally pour into nations where free markets and easy opportunities come. Not that these markets are without regulations, but on the contrary, they have laws that permit investors and allow profit-making and sharing. And this trend has hit one of the last closed economies in the world, right here on the African continent, Ethiopia. It started with the deregulation of its telecommunications sector, and that decision brought in many prospective investors who have sought telecommunications licenses. Now that process is almost complete. And now the banking sector is at the top of the agenda, waiting for parliamentary approval to kickstart. Already, Ethiopia has 18 banks in operation, two of which are owned by the government. But will this be as eagerly received as the telecommunications sector reforms? And of course, what does this mean for Ethiopia? Today, we'll be looking at the Ethiopian conversation as it continues deregulation and it hits the banking sector. This is Business Edge. I'm Tolulakwe Adilaru Balogun. My guest today is Ali Khan Sachu, Africa geoeconomist and macro analyst, as well as the CEO of Rich Management. Ali Khan, welcome back to Business Edge. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So we've seen that with Ethiopia's economy particularly, it has found a way to be somewhat stable. And this opening up of the economy, first with the telecommunications sector and now with the banking sector, has been quite interesting, one of the last closed economies in the world. What's pushing this drive? This was one of the promises that Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed did make when he took power in 2018. But what's pushing this drive now for Ethiopia to open up? So, as you said, uh, 2018, Prime Minister Abiy um, uh, excited uh, investors, local and international. Um, he spoke about an opening up of the economy, um, a, a change of direction, uh, Ethiopia, as you said in your introduction, had been a closed economy for many years um, and investors were very excited by that prospect. Um, the, the first uh, big reform drive was obviously with the telecoms license and uh, Safaricom with Vodacom um, had taken one of those licenses um, and uh, are setting up shop. So, so that's happening. Of course, uh, everyone has been salivating at the banking sector opportunity. You know, you've got more than 100 million people in Ethiopia, largely untapped uh, market, notwithstanding there being 18 banks. And I think, you know, a bunch of banks, both uh, regional and international, were very excited by the prospect. Now, of course, um, we had a significant change of direction at the political level. We had uh, this uh, issue with the Tigray, uh, the TPLF, um, and essentially the reform process was put on hold. And I think uh, this statement has come out uh, about the banking uh, reform um, this week. I think it was also uh, in conjunction with comments about how negotiations could begin with the government and the TPLF. So I think. The government's uh, back, back on track, um, particularly with the economy, which has been badly squeezed. This was the, you know, the story of the African Renaissance was Ethiopia, double digit uh, GDP growth for close to a decade. Then we had the slowdown, which was the civil war related. Um, I think last year GDP expanded at 2%, projections for this year at 4%. But I think Abby's signaling he's back on track, um, he's back in the game, and I think there'll be a lot of interest, uh, particularly if uh, the unrest now starts to come down and go onto a negotiating path. And we generally get the sentiment that being a closed economy is sort of a bad thing, that it's anti-competitive, it doesn't allow uh, sectors to develop and to keep pace. But were there any benefits for Ethiopia in particular uh, having their economy closed, particularly key sectors like telecoms and banking, staying so closed off from the rest of the world? Were there any benefits that the country gained? Well, I, I think, you know, obviously they had that period of uh, stellar growth, double-digit growth, uh, as you said, without uh, external assistance, mostly organically driven. 
Um, uh, I, I think one can argue that um, for the, the country and the economy at that time, that uh, you know they didn't suffer any downside, uh, significant downside risks. The problem has been, of course, that, that there was heavy borrowing that was uh, state-led. Um, which drove that GDP expansion. And I think that kind of model, you know, it works for a period of time, but then it starts to run out of run out of steam, particularly because you haven't got the private sector playing a big enough role. And the private sector understands business. It tends to have a much uh, a better understanding of the business landscape and is prepared to take um, different types of risks. So I think the cost, uh, the downside costs of that particular model is you don't develop your private sector, um, and you become very much a top-down model, um, and you don't get organic entrepreneurship d d developing. And I think that's what Abby saw, and that's what he was trying to address in 2018, and clearly is now seeking to deal with um, uh, this year. So we can make a conversation for the opening up of the Ethiopian economy to outside investment, but it's not just that. Um, a year after he became prime minister, Abiy, had, under his leadership, Ethiopia unveiled its homegrown economic reform that wants to move the country from a, an agrarian-based economy to a more industrialized middle-income economy. In the succeeding years that have happened now, how do you think his administration has fared in making that change and making sort of that transition? And what reforms, if we leave out the telecoms, if we leave out the banking, what reforms have really come into play to make this possible? So it, it, it's very interesting, that question. I think, you know, Ethiopia basically was looking at a, what I would call a Chinese manufacturing type model, um, making itself a, a low cost manufacturing hub um, leveraging the low cost of human capital, doing things like Vietnam and the uh, Asian Tigers did, which was leverage your human resource, bring it to the global market at a very reasonable price, um, become the global one of the global exporters of choice, create jobs, and then basically go for value addition. You know, do it in a sequence. So there, were, there was a lot of investment in um, factories. Um, there was also the perception that China had become too prosperous and needed destinations to take its manufacturing into places like the African continent. Um, and I think that's the opportunity that they were seeking uh, uh, with that particular plan. Now, what happened, of course, there was enormous amounts of investment into that. A lot of the global um, textile industries, for example, piled in there amongst others. But what has happened is, of course, the uh, instability in the country mm. um, uh, caused a lot of pressure to come on that particular side. And then you had the AGOA um, issue. Um, Ethiopia was punished by the U.S. Uh, because of the civil war and um, were removed from the AGOA agreement. And that made it uh, uneconomical for a number of people who'd set up shop in, in Ethiopia. So I think he's really got to stabilize the political situation and a lot will flow positively mm. from that stabilization. But I think now is the time for him to do that. All right, so let's take a break here because that really was one of my next questions in terms of this um, insecurity that Ethiopia is dealing with and how much of a threat it could be to its economic growth. But when we come back, we'll get into the banking sector, the financial sector. What reforms are we, are we expecting to come? Uh, what does the parliament need to do? And how far are things going with the telecommunications uh, opening as well? And we can, might use that to sort of judge how this will go. So the conversation is focusing on Ethiopia as one of the last closed economies in the world, right here on the continent, is not just opening up its telecommunications sector, but is now opening up its financial sector. What would that mean for Ethiopia's economy? The conversation continues after this.
Still with me is Ali Khan Sachu, Africa geo-economist and macro analyst and the CEO of Rich Management as we look at Ethiopia now opening up its financial sector. Now, Ali Khan, um, we're hearing from the prime minister that the banking sector is now to be opened up to foreign players and that there is going to be some kind of parliamentary approval and, of course, a policy amendment for the sector. What do you envision? What are we expecting? How long might it take to sort of put the regulation and framework together? I, I think they're going to uh, fast track this regulation. I don't think you would be making those sorts of statements unless it was pretty far down the track. Um, uh, clearly, they're going to have to uh, reboot the legislation. Um, uh, previously, uh, the only permission was that you could set up a, uh, you could set up a representative office. Now you're going to be allowed to capitalize a subsidiary. Um, a bank in, in, in Ethiopia. So um, I suspect that we're talking about a maximum of six months from now mm. before the legislation is in place, if not quicker. Um, and uh, I think it will be a catalyst uh, for first, I suspect, uh, regional banks. I think the Kenyan banks have been very interested in going into that market. I know Kenya Commercial Bank has been waiting for quite a while, amongst others. So I think you'll get a very fast uh, a number of regional banks coming in. Um, and then I think, you know, international banks uh, will also be looking at the opportunities. So I see regional banks, I see the likes of Standard Bank of South Africa. I even imagine some Nigerian banks will like to, will look at the opportunity uh, maybe uh, uh, other banks piggybacking on the mobile money phenomena uh, mm. piling in as well. So what would be the attraction for these banks? As you said, Kenya is right at Ethiopia's doorstep. The mobile money uh, revolution in East Africa, particularly being driven by Kenya, is quite uh, impressive and massive. So Kenyan banks would want to export that. But beyond mobile mom money, what would be the attention or the, rather the attraction uh, for those who want to invest? 18 commercial banks, two government-owned banks, What's bringing them to Ethiopia's banking sector? So it, it, it's interesting, you know, I, I think the banking sector is relatively unsophisticated, um, uh, probably uh, poorly capitalized in the context of the two years that we've had recently. So I think that makes it an interesting time for uh, people to come in, particularly if they are well capitalized. I think the opportunities you touched on were obviously um, uh, mobile money is one. I think that there's an enormous opportunity in agri, in the agri side. You know, this although they're trying to transition from an agricultural economy, there's still a major agricultural story um, that banks can leverage. So I would imagine the likes of the European agricultural banks, like Rabobank, would be looking at this opportunity. So, and then I think, you know, consumer banking, I, I, I think the banking penetration rate is very low. You've got, you know, you can bank people via the phone today. So it's not a question of setting up thousands of branches. You can do it uh, very easily and reasonably cheaply. And then I think, you know, you've got this, uh, you, you've got, this is, this is one of the virgin markets for banking. Um, uh, in, in Africa. So it's a big opportunity. And I think, um, you know, there will be a lot of interest in getting in here. So now this follows, of course, the liberalization of the te telecommunications sector. And we saw a consortium of uh, well-known uh, telecom players come into uh, Ethiopia, MTN, Safaricom as well. We're hearing that that is sort of on the way to completion, building of a new network as well. So what, what's, what's the impression? Um, what are some of the feedback we're getting when it comes to how the telecoms opening has helped Ethiopia? And we can take away from that and look at how the banking and the financial opening can also be of service uh, to the country. So um, let me just say, as far as I'm aware, I think MTN stepped back. They didn't, um, they didn't go through with that application uh, in the end. And I suspect that was because of the political uncertainty at the mm. time. Um, Safaricom uh, stepped up to the plate, which is natural because they understand the region better and, uh, and hopefully understand the risks better. Safaricom um, have been moving forward. You know, um, in, in their case, uh, I expect they'll be up and running in about six, six months properly. 
Mm. And for them, I think as well, it's a huge opportunity from the M-Pesa point of view, right? I mean, you know, that's a business that is about 33% of their revenues. They've expanded it. They've made it a huge uh, mobile um, environment, which has been highly profitable. And I think that's what's exciting them. So I think uh, Abby uh, will also offer another license at some point. Um, and I suspect MTN will probably take that. Mm -hmm. But I think the, quick, the, the prerequisite for that happening is going to be uh, further signals of stabilization within the country, because I think that was the reason that MTN stepped back. All right, so let's look at some of the projections for Ethiopia's economy in the coming year. Um, as we know now, the economy has found a way to be stable, even with some of the situations, particularly the, um, the political, but more likely the security ones. In the first half of the fiscal year, which began July 2021, revenue grew by 14.9% compared to the same period in the previous year. And we're seeing that the African Development Bank is projecting that Ethiopia's GDP growth should recover around 8% in 2022. Do you think this is a feasible projection? Will they hit that, overshoot, or maybe just touch it a little bit? So that's interesting that the AFDB have put out uh, such a number, which is a pretty bold call. I mean, you're coming off 2%, um, but there's obviously a base effect as well, because when GDP is suppressed and you, you can rebound and the number looks bigger. Um, I will just point out that the IMF refused to forecast a figure because of the un levels of uncertainty, which was a highly unusual uh, scenario uh, from the IMF. Look, I think uh, there is going to be a rebound. Um, I think you know we're seeing a better language coming out of, out, out of the government. But I do think that you know it's a chicken and egg situation that you've got to stabilize the country. You've got to negotiate with the TPLF. You've got to take the country off this kind of war footing. Mm. You know, they're, they're out of the state of emergency, which they were in. So that's a positive step. But I think once those things happen, then you're going to get a tremendous boost. And I think you'll be much higher than 8%. But it's got to happen first, I think. All right, to deal with the insecurity first, and then you can see that massive growth. Ali Khan Satyu, as always, a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. All right. And eyes will continue to remain on Ethiopia, not just because of the security situation the country finds itself in, but because it is one of the last closed economies. The opening of the telecom sector and now the financial and banking sector could lead to massive growth and investment. But as my guest has said, security will remain a major concern for those who want to invest in Ethiopia. And until that is taken care of, the numbers may not reflect the potential. You're watching Business Edge. Up next is NC4 to watch. And now to a few stories we're keeping our eyes on. A London court will today begin to hear a lawsuit brought by Nigeria against U.S. bank J.P. Morgan Chase, claiming more than $1.7 billion for its role in a disputed 2011 oil field deal. Now, the civil suit filed in the English courts in 2017 relates to the purchase of offshore OPL245 oil field in Nigeria by energy major Shell and ENI, which is also at the center of ongoing legal action in Italy. Oil prices stabilized on Wednesday after hitting seven-year highs in the last session as it became clear that the first wave of U.S. and European sanctions on Russia for sending troops into eastern Ukraine would not disrupt oil prices. Brent crude rose 11 cents to $96.95 a barrel after soaring as high as $99.50 a barrel on Tuesday, the highest since September 2014. Sudan's Mineral Resources Minister has said that gold exports exceeded $1.7 billion for the first time in 2021. The gold exports accounted for 40% of all exports last year, and the country expects a record jump in gold production this year with new investors entering the market. And finally, Morocco's High Commission for Planning reports that consumer price index has risen by 3.1% year-on-year in January. Food prices were up 4.3%, while non-food inflation increased by 2.3%. On a month-on-month -month basis, the index was almost flat, rising just 0.1%.
Core CPI, which excludes prices of volatile goods, rose 0.3% on a month-on-month -month basis and was up 3.2% year-on-year. And that's the business we have for you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, follow on social media at New Central TV. Download our mobile app, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and watch us on the platforms we are available. I'm Tolu Lakwe, Adela Rubalogun. Have a fantastic day.